No, no, you didn't. You just gave there it is. The voice told me. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. Hazel, the floor is yours. Um, what What would you like to? How would you like to say? So thank you so much, Irma. Greetings, everybody, and welcome. Hazel, I'm, I can't hear you. See if you're yeah. muted. Oh, that's is that Edie? Is that Edie? No, it's Anna Foster. <clears throat> Anna Foster. Anna Foster. No. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, to tell you, we, we Jeremiah and I had a little time back and forth with the muting and the unmuting, so that may be something. You're not hearing me, Anna? Speakers no. are off, or speakers are off, maybe? She needs to, can she join with audio? Has she joined joined with audio? You yeah, you, your you have to press Well. Gratitude, anyhow, to the Greenfield Public Library and to Jeremiah for facilitating. Did, did you get sound, Anna? How could you miss the sound of my voice? Goodness me. Oh. <laughs> um. You may well, need to leave and come back in. And when it asks you if you want to join with Wi-Fi, you say yes. Yeah, that's that's one possibility. Right, exactly. And is honestly, the problem is that she can't hear any of these suggestions. <laughs> true. Yeah, um, but we will be recording it, so right. ultimately she will get to hear. She's um, probably liquid, the brilliant woman. <laughs> type it in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. we'll Thank you. I'll try that. Oh yeah, Hazel. I Hazel, it's Amy. I may be yes, just yes. being, I may just be on audio because I have to, right. so, but right. thank you. Thank you. Lots of love. Bye. <clears throat> Wisty and I were comparing our heads. Try to play test tone. Please don't type anything during the week. Well, I'm going to launch into this, but and does anybody have to, does anybody have a short time and have to leave? I'm so happy to see everybody, especially Anna Foster, even though she's rather quiet at the moment, and Phyllis, brilliant Phyllis. I know. Hey Hazel, I have to leave around 10.30. Okay, well, I'm going to, just start mentioning that even though I grew up here, everything is so different. Uh, and I know we all knew about <clears throat> different words that were used. But has anybody ever wondered why it's so different on the other side of the pond in England? After all, there's an American trillion and a million millions in England. Or why is an American billion an English thousand millions? Math, which is called maths with an S in the UK, is not my strong point. So I have no answer. Does anyone know? But I don't. <clears throat> I, I tried to research that and I couldn't find it. Too often I think I'm learning a new language, which must be good. Some people think that Noah Webster was to blame. And this is partly true. I visited Noah Webster's house in the village of Greenfield in Dearborn, Michigan, and I learned that Webster preferred spellings that match pronunciation better, and he chose existing options such as center, color, and check, E-C-K. And as for differences in other words, the US definition of quarter notes, half notes, and full notes is more understandable than the British name, which, which are chords, crotchets, and semi-quavers. So what about the debate over which side of the road to draw or par? Does anybody have any comment on that? Do you well, sound at Yeah, Hazel, I always thought that maths with a plural sounded kind of redundant because growing up here, math is like, 
already giant and multi and it's enough. You don't need an S. <laughs> Sorry. If I say math here, yeah, they say, do you mean maths? I know, <laughs> I know. I'm just being, you know, you know, kind of belligerent about it. But yeah, why do you need yeah. an S? Already, it's already plural. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. But Carol, when you Carol, when you were visiting in England, did you drive a car at all? You're I muted. Didn't, I, I didn't drive a car at all because I was in London and I used oh. the underground. And then when Robin and I went out beyond London, we hitchhiked. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> Little old ladies would stop. Uh, we, we had our, our skirts on and our suitcases. There were no backpacks. And um, little old ladies would pick us up and they would give us wonderful tours. Oh, cool. Cool. Wonderful. Wonderful. And it didn't, it didn't particularly bother you because you weren't driving, but you didn't feel concerned that it was on the other side of the road? Uh, well, hitchhiking had to be on the other side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it didn't bother me because there weren't these uh, fast uh, roundabouts that seem to be all over now in England. Yes. I don't yes. look forward to driving in England now. Oh. Well, actually, I thought I would not have a car for the first year until I really got my bearings. I'm never going to have a car now. It's unbelievable. The, the, it is legal for drivers. They can be driving west and they see a spot on the other side of the road to park and they just zoom over, nobody honks. And they doesn't matter which way they're facing. And in the US, you get a ticket if they catch you, if you're facing, if you're not facing so that the driver can step out comfortably. It, it is just amazing. But that's a, just one of the differences. But I started researching why the cars, in 76 countries, vehicles use the left side. And in the 18th century London, there was a law. Traffic had to, on London Bridge, had to keep left to reduce coll collisions. And before that, in 1776, Britain followed the ancient Roman traditions and left-hand traffic was dominant. And in continental Europe, Napoleon introduced the right-hand um, rule. And then in the 20th century, there was a move to harmonize road laws and a gradual shift from driving on the left to the right. And the Swedes were the last Europeans to change. And they changed overnight on Dagen Day, which was September the 3rd, 1967. At 10 to 5, all the traffic stopped in Sweden for 10 minutes and they restarted driving on the right. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. Anna, I think, are you hearing? Hi, Hazel, it's good to see you. Wonderful, you, you, you clarified whatever it was. Excellent, wonderful to see, to see you as well as everybody else. You and too. That, yeah. Wonderful. So, hey, Hazel, I wanted to say when I was uh, in Edinburgh, the whole idea of the traffic being on the other side, I ha I kept being pulled by people on the sidewalk because I would forget and I'd be walking on one side of the sidewalk thinking I was safe, that I was going to see cars coming. And I wasn't. It's, and, you know, all of a sudden the car would zip by me on my left and was like, oh, right, the cars are on the other side. <laughs> and so somebody, you know, not that I was always drifting into the street, but I would get, you know, I would just forget. And, and if I wanted to cross, I would think that I was looking in the wrong direction to see where the car was coming to cross. And I had to kind of keep backing up. Yes, I know. It just is. Um, I know I was thinking of you, Paul, when you were in Scotland, thinking about the times when you were in Scotland at the fringe and, um, thinking that between everything else, because that's the interesting thing. The United Kingdom is technically four countries. It's England, Scotland, uh, Wales, and North Ireland. And uh, they all drive on the same side. But yeah, even, even now I have to be very, very careful. And the other thing is, um, and Massachusetts is very special. Um, they allow 
pedestrians to feel safe. And in general, the drivers are careful. Here, I really feel that they would like, that the drivers would like pedestrians to disappear and not use, <laughs> not use the road. I actually had a, an encounter with a little sports car I had almost reached the other side of the road and the pavement, which is not a sidewalk, it's a pavement. And um, this little car slid behind me and I turned around, his windows were open, I said, really? And he said, get off the road, I'm paying for the tax. And I was just, I was, for once in my life, I was wordless. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't happen very often, but um, I, um, a lot of the new words to me are city gate gyratory. Does anybody know what that might mean? Nope. No, well, it slid by the window of the taxi I was in. And gyratory, gyratory means a road junction in a circulatory manner more complex than a roundabout. Wow. Was, yeah, you couldn't say big roundabout or major roundabout. No, it's a gy city gate gyratory. And then the other word, which has really amazed me, and my brother, my brother, by the way, and my sister-in-law were going to be here, but they, they left for France in a hurry last night because um, my sister-in-law's uncle in his 90s has finally decided he will return to England. So they have to go and um, empty the flat and um, bring him back. So anyhow, one of the words that absolutely staggered me is conurbation. Does anybody know what a conurbation is? No. All right. Well, it mean it was coined actually in in a book by Patrick Geddes in 1915, Cities in Evolution, and he gave examples of the Ruhr in Germany and northeastern seaboard in the U.S. And it means a built up of urban areas. I think these days it may be metropolitan in the U.S., but no, it's conurbation here. <laughs> there we have. I've um. I've had a surprising, as I say, I always knew that sidewalk and pavement and um, queue and line, and that was something that here, uh, I knew that a, in England, a lift is an elevator. I'm sure everybody sort of knows that anyhow, yes. And lift in the UK means somebody will also give you a ride. And of course, I queue waiting for bus, um, and we wait in an orderly line. Does anybody know what a fortnight is? Aha. Uh -huh. You're no fair, Linda. <laughs> you're in Scotland and you're from Australia, so... Um... <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> yes, two weeks, exactly. And it, it's from the old English for 14 nights. So who knew that? Not me. <laughs> and, you know, for years, I only watched US television like Democracy Now! and the BBC News and British Mysteries. And moving back to England, watching TV is a good way to try to catch up with the changes and the politics. Um, at first, I was incredibly surprised and actually embarrassed at some of the language on some of the TV shows. Uh, does anybody know the brainiac Stephen Fry? A little bit, heard of him. Yes. Yes, he's, he's amazing. Um, he, yes, he, very much. Yes, he rarely indulges in graphic language, but on the marvelous um, show, TV show QI, um, there are four panelists and the presenter, usually Stephen Fry or Sandy Toskvix, and um, they casually use words about body parts. And I'm sort of, at first I'm sitting there going, oh, oh my golly. And um, now I'm used to it, so, but I'm, I'm restraining myself <laughs> in front of you poor people. <laughs> so let's see. Um, I'm wondering. Hazel, have you run into phrases? When I was in Scotland, the phrase that was different was here, everybody says no problem. And there they would say no worries. Yes, which surprises me. As well. No worries. That's a very um, Australian, isn't it, Linda? Yes, it's 
it's basically no worries means everything's great. Yeah, yeah it was very interesting. It was just a different, it may, I mean, I, well, being a writer, you know, looking at words or listening to words and what it means. And, you know, when you say there's no problem, you're kind of assuming there was a problem, but I'm not going to let it be a problem or something or, or uh, you know, something about a problem. And no worries just suddenly, when it said a couple of times, it took me a couple of minutes to go, oh, okay, so you're, you're letting me know it's okay with you, but in a different way of doing that, you know. Right, yes, yes. Well, Faith, when I was in England, um, back in the 80s, I ran into a similar thing with the expression, sorry, or excuse me. And I was using sorry, if I bumped into somebody, they were looking at me as if I had said, excuse me, and wanted to talk to them. <laughs> oh, that's interesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I was I was very struck, Faith, when you told when you said that, because one of the words that comes automatically to most British people is sorry. And, you know, sometimes you go around the corner and there's somebody also going around the corner the other way and you both, whoops, you back off and say, oh, sorry, sorry. It, it's um, it's a word that trips off the British tongue quite, uh, quite readily. But excuse me also, um, excuse me would certainly be in when you said when you were in London, that would certainly be um, bumping into people is, yes. But you know, that was what the first thing I noticed when I moved, I had been, well, after, after years of living in England, growing up in England, then working in other countries and then moving to, the, to New York, I was amazed people bumped into you. you people never bumped into you in, in London. And I don't know whether it's team, team sports playing, um, but you just wove your way, you know, it was very crowded. But uh, back in the 60s in New York, um, you were jostled, however. I still don't <laughs> hold it against them. <laughs> so, so you know, yeah, the so, 60s in New York, that was quite the scene though, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, again, wow. another place wow. has changed. Phyllis, you, you had some time in England, right? Yeah, a um, long time ago. <laughs> well, yeah, in the, around 2000, we went back and uh, spent mostly in, in uh, around uh, Glastonbury and, and that area. Mm. But um, yeah, we went down to Tintagel and, and traveled around more the southern part, you know, the stone circles and the wood circle and all that yes. neat stuff, Avebury Hill. Um, yeah. yeah, it was great. I, I mm -hmm. loved uh, Glastonbury especially. But mm -hmm. yeah, way back in 1967, I think it was, I went there uh, and spent a term at um, Exeter University. Oh, you and, did? Oh, yeah, did yeah. Really uh, yeah, my whole all the English majors who were juniors in the school I was going to went. So there were about, you know, 12 of us maybe. And um, it was really fun because, you know, we were more part of everything then. We, we took a, <clears throat> a side trips on the weekends, sometimes in buses and sometimes we would uh, just borrow bikes from people. And um, my friend and I uh, borrowed bikes and got on a train and went down to Tintagel and and rode all around um, one weekend. It was pouring rain and we had a great time. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we had fun. Oh, the thing I remember most is that at uh, um, uh, Stonehenge, we could just walk up to the stones back then. And uh, then when I was there in 2000, uh, there was a walkway and it was, it was all fenced off. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, it, it, it uh, has changed. You can still walk around the stones at Avebury. Um, yeah. Which, yeah yes, which, which, well, so along with the sheep. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad that a lot of, uh, even in the States, uh, there's some trend by selfies of people putting their names on or doing stuff at these various, you know, monuments or historic places has created having to guard them. It's kind of a weird... Yes. Yeah. 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 True. Very true. Linda, you have a, a, an unusual combination of experiences because you lived in Australia, you live in Scotland, you've been to England quite a lot. Even uh, um, your mother, my favorite cousin, Barbara, took you to Stonehenge when you were quite young, right? 
So are there any specific things that stick out for you? And in differences and similarities, you mean? Well, yeah. Australia, Australia uh, is basically a British colony, so we relate Ooh. much more. Well, when I was young, we related much more to um, Britain. We'd call lollies sweets and um, the vacuum cleaner a hoover and mm -hmm. things like that. But nowadays, um, since probably the 70s, and maybe, no, no, probably late 80s, we've followed America much more in Australia. So the kids oh. call things lollies now. We never used to have Halloween at all when I was growing up. Now it's really yeah. big. Yeah, I dislike that. <laughs> Sorry, Americans. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it just was never celebrated, not, not something that we um, did. Um, we drive on the same side of the road as, as the Brits and... Um, I think we have uh, similar terms of phrase uh, in a lot of ways because a lot of the Cockney slang came across with people oh, with the Scottish yeah. words as well. So there's some similarities mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. When I went to uh, California, I, I found um, America to be very different from what I was expecting because you sort of feel like you know it because you've seen it on television with all the shows and the sitcoms and but yeah, it was very different from what I was expecting. A lot of advertising on the side of the road, and um, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And, and, and I don't like the way they spell the word tire. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's, funny. It. <laughs> that's funny. That's a sum of the spelling, yes. But so, Susan, we were going to be meeting last year until COVID blew us and everybody else out of the water. But you have friends in the middle of the of England, yes? North, the north, in, north. in, uh, in Derby, in Derby. Derby. Right, right. And you had, as I recall, you were in Europe and you were going to pop over to Derby, pop back to Europe, pop down to me. <laughs> no, I was going to come from the States to Derby, hang out oh. there for a while, then go to Italy and uh, for my singing camp and then for my singing camp come back and visit you and then go home and the thing that was so exciting about all of that besides seeing all these wonderful people I haven't seen for a while is that I could get around without a car and it made me yeah. so happy it yeah. made it just you know because I do look the wrong way when I'm when I'm in, in in England and it drives me crazy I try really hard but I don't always succeed so, but uh, that was going to be the trip and I was really looking forward to it. And, you know, maybe we'll still be able to do it after all this is over. Yes, let's hope, let's hope. It, it's, um, it's very difficult to predict. And um, I have been contemplating, uh, you know, a trip, but I keep thinking, well, if everybody comes to visit me, why do I have to go over there? <laughs> But I, I, I'm hoping that um, I'm hoping that we will be able to travel um, comfortably. Um, I was a little apprehensive about flying to Scotland, um, but luckily for me, and I don't think it was intentional, but the seating was quite socially distanced. And the wonderful thing in Scotland is everybody wears a mask. In England, not so much. Um, they're, they're talking about the rates of infection are rising and the government is still, well, sorry, Boris in England is still not saying, um, no, you must wear your mask. Um, so it's up to your, you know, individual, but um, it's, uh, it was such a, such a relief to me in Scotland to everybody who went inside. It, they just put on their mask. They just know it's a sensible thing to do. So. I've had people say to me, well, the government says we don't have to. And I say, yes, but the government says it's also a good thing to wear your mask. Oh, I don't know. I just, um, yeah. And there was a man behind me on the flight back who said that, um, and he was conspicuously not wearing a mask, one of the only people on the flight. And he said, um, no, I, telling the people next to him, no, I don't have a medical exemption. I don't have a reason. Uh, it's a principal thing. And I'm thinking, oh, golly. So supposedly he'd been looking after his, one of his grandkids, a little baby in Scotland. And I'm thinking, I just wonder about that. But anyhow. Wow. <laughs> anyhow. Hazel, to what do you attribute the um, 
you know, much more mask wearing in Scotland over England. Why do you think? Because well, think- Nicola Sturgeon makes it law here, <laughs> and that she's our leader. Uh, she's the first, like, like the first minister of Scotland. Oh, the yes. Party. So they have a, a devolved government here, and right. they can make those decisions. Well, I think. Yeah, I think there's another factor also. Um, the population in Scotland is smaller. Um, it's the population here is much larger, and there's a lot of um, traveling around. And I suspect, and again, this is um, my own uh, scenario. I suspect that the British, that Boris, felt that in England he was going to lose a lot of votes and that businesses were on his back and he decided uh, okay you don't really i'm not going to say you must wear a mask so um and this morning even they were saying surely he's going to the government is going to um revise that and say mask wearing is compulsory nope not going to do it so they're relying on the vaccination um uh scheme and um as we all so you might be a Amazed at how much it's uh, divided, you know, even here in Greenfield and among the word uh, groups. I had a person come to my third Tuesday. Luckily, I moved to the lava center, so they're taking care of people at the door. But somebody showed up last week and said, uh, I'm not wearing a mask. And I just kind of asked, oh, how come? And they said the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and I said, I said the Ten Commandments, was it 7C or 3B or... <laughs> <laughs> don't covet the neighbor's wife and don't take their mask. I mean, I was, you know, I was like, which one was it? I was trying to figure out. And um, then when Lava stepped in, they said, no, Massachusetts law. They looked like they were just, you know, running different scenarios. Finally, they were told we had masks. If they want to take it, they could come in. If not, they couldn't. And, you know, they kind of screamed and yelled and left. But we're, it's definitely, and it was one of the reasons I canceled my festival at the Shea because I didn't want to be the person at the door trying to stop all these people and ask them for stuff. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm staggered. Um, and, and the fellow behind me on the flight, he was also um, saying that he was asked um, in the terminal because there were you know, big signs, wear a mask in the terminal, please. And he was asked, um, oh, do you need a mask? And his response was, if you lay one finger on me, there will be such a lawsuit, you will wish you were never born. I'm thinking, really? It just, um, and he had a very, um, a very gentle way of speaking, but he was clearly rather pugnacious. So I, um, I felt very sorry for the couple sitting next to him, <laughs> husband and wife, I'm thinking, oh, they must be thrilled, you know, so. so I'm wondering, let me see, I, Susan, Carol, is Peter going to join us later, Carol? No, you're muted, you're muted, unmute. Peter decided yesterday with this gorgeous weather, he would head up to Lake Champlain. Oh my. He want, hey, there's a project he wants to do on a boat. So um, I was away playing Scrabble at Dorothy's house and I come home and the car is gone and (laughs) he left clues as to where he went. Um, So I I expect clues. That's great. Clues. (laughs) Speaking of board game. (laughs) So uh, I expect him back tonight. He, He didn't. He's not here at the moment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Oh, I was looking forward because on his um, on his epic sale. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I can speak a little bit about that because he has told the tale several times. Um, there were it was a crew that left from Nova Scotia that headed off to England across the Atlantic on our. Um, 32 foot boat, sailboat, and uh, including Phyllis Loomis and uh, Fred, our son, and Peter, uh, and uh, two others. And the, uh, the wonderful thing was, it was a gloomy crossing. There was no sunshine. It was overcast the whole way. 
very quiet, no storms, and they arrive uh, on the coast of England, and um, they go into the first, I think, what it was it, Falmouth they went into? Um, but uh, the sun shone. <laughs> and finally, they saw the sun after a three-week crossing. It was My very God. slow. <laughs> wow. But uh, they uh, enjoyed the trip uh, and visiting England, and they went to um, Jersey Isles and uh, also and uh, back again to England to get some wood so they could make supports for the mast that was going to come down when they crossed France on the canals. Oh, right, right. So uh, that was quite, it was a lovely time in England for them. Uh, they, and they got showers and they got regular food and <laughs> so yeah. I'm sure he could tell the tale better. <laughs> oh well well I won't hold it against him that he had to do something on the boat. <laughs> while the while the weather held it's almost yes. it, it hasn't frozen yet. Ah. Here we haven't had a frost yet. Yes no it just well, there, there are two other friends um, um, in Greenfield, well, yes, in Greenfield, who were in England, and I had asked them, but they weren't able to join. But one of the stories, um, John Preston is very tall, and not that his wife, Mary Ellen, is short, but she's not quite as tall as John. And so they had, I think they were with family, two, two other tall people, and they had rented a car, and John is you know, squished up in the passenger seat, and somebody said, golly, these cars are so small. And John said, but they're comfortable. The armrest is wonderful. And the person behind him said, that's my leg. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a small car <laughs> and a long leg, I suppose. But um, so we have lost... Edie, but, and Suzanne, you said you were in England again many years ago, right? But it was mostly in London, was it? Oh, no, yeah, that was, <clears throat> I think I explained that that was um, a short stopover, I think. It must have been overnight because I saw three theater plays <laughs> and during that time, and I didn't experience much of anything else, so... I, I have no reflection, but I do have a question, and, and I want to apologize for running away. I, I finally got a call back from a place I needed to make an appointment, so um, <clears throat> that worked out. Um, so and I'm sorry, I missed uh, what happened in between those seven minutes or so. Um, so my question was, I'm wondering, um, because we're the nation of immigrants, and you're, I think it um, what has England had a lot of immigrants over the, you know, 20 to 50 years or whatever, or over a hundred or the last hundred years even, um, and how has that affected uh, them? And, and it must be different from big cities to more uh, smaller areas, but more rural areas. But I just wonder if you have some experience with that. That's a great question because there are, I've, I've always felt that in general, it's a very inclusive type of community in the country. And it seems even more so to me now, um, which is lovely. There, every nation is represented. Usually they've moved here because they wanted to live here and um, have become part of the, you know, uh, part of the communities where they live. But the crossings on the channel this year by the summer time, by July, there had been 3,500 people crossing from France in tiny little rubber boats, usually enormously crowded. And last year, there were people smugglers who brought people across the channel and more than 8,000 people arrived. Now, these were not technically legal immigrants. And it's been, it's been very heartbreaking really to see them arriving frequently. Their boats capsize and they don't survive. 
Frequently they're rescued by the Coast Guard. Um, but yes, there are, there are many, many um, immigrants and the net mi migration rate is two, I have the figure, 2.47 migrants per thousand population. And so this small country with uh, four nations is becoming even more crowded. And that was another thing that struck me. I've been to Scotland periodically to see my sister who lives way up. up. Um, she's two hours west of Aberdeen, which is really very close to the top of Scotland. And Linda is in farming country at the end of the, just at the beginning of the Highlands. And what struck me was that there were, there was so much more space, not only in the countryside, but in the villages and in the towns that we visited. And um, I can only think that uh, eventually there will be not as much space. In fact, I think I said once because as we're driving, you know, I'm just looking at the views. Um, absolutely such beautiful countryside. Reminds me very much of Maine. But I, I said to Linda, I wonder in 100 years if there will be buildings on the hills. Um, so I don't know if Maine gets more crowded as the years go by. Um, maybe the weather also is a factor. But the current population in the UK is 68 million. And they're thinking it's going to go up a million a year, um, which um, I presume this is between having babies and things, but um, there's there's a, I think we're bucking, we're bucking the, um, the trend. I forget, but let me see, somewhere I had a note about that. Um, when, but interestingly enough, our, our labor market relies on migration for particular positions. 26% of doctors in the National Health Service are from abroad, from out of um, the UK. And um, the National Health Service, as you know, is an amazing health service. They, they were really pushed to the wall um, during the beginning of the pandemic and they survived. Um, they, they were able to rescue, or I shouldn't say rescue, but they were able to um, keep so many people living uh, despite terrible illnesses and um, the various treatments have, that they developed have been so effective. Um, there's much concern now about flu season and the pandemic. Um, so it's interesting, what will this winter bring? But um, yeah, migration is quite effective. But Suzanne, do I not remember that you had, um, you had a visit with your family when your son was little, and didn't he go to a, a, um, a school for the blind in England? No, no. The only school for the blind was in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, so when you got back to Austria, that was then the difference. Um, what was that? Well, you... As I recall, you and your husband and family were in Pennsylvania for your husband's work, and that's when your son went to the school for the blind. And then yes. when, when you returned, he was the only youngster who knew about walking on the street um, with us. Oh, right. We, we moved to Germany and he went to another blind school. And uh, it was, um, fortunately, it was um, a streetcar away you know, through several communities, um, you know, probably... 40 minute ride or so, but um, he was the first one to arrive with mobility skills and uh, long using a long cane to get around. And so, yeah, right. I, I just wonder how the mobility skill training is in England. And if people who are blind have the long cane and know how to get around on their own without it. And... Well, actually my grandmother was blind and she did go to a school for the blind and she was a phenomenal cook and um, she kept a great house. So, and she used to take, I, I was the only one of my brothers and sisters who wanted to go visit her. I, I'm that much older than them. Um, and um, she used to take me shopping We we would trot out, you know, she had the white cane, et cetera. So, and that was back in the day. 
Um, so I can only hope that uh, I do see occasionally people um, who are blind, who have a white cane and who seem to navigate, which absolutely astounds me. I, I don't know how, um, I don't know how they manage because- uh, I, have to, I have to interrupt and say there are two different white canes because I think it's traditional for a long time that blind people have had a white cane, but the one that's different is it's about chest high if you stand it up um, you know, and, and it's used uh, to tap from side to side to, and, and so you have to have some sense of orientation of where you are and where you're going, and, but you're, you're clearing to make sure there's no obstacle by swinging the cane back and forth, like two steps ahead of where, you know, you swing right. it right as you step left, and then, and, and then you know when your next step will be clear. So um, it's an amazing training and um, an amazing way for people to get around. So, um, and I, I know sometimes if you run into some construction site, uh, you might you might get help from people. You might not. My son has run into trouble in downtown Phoenix uh, with that, and and it you know people would just go by him, but the person who stopped to help him was in a wheelchair. So that was really nice. So I'm just wondering um, if you see much of those uh, people getting around independently as blind people. Well, now you say that, I've only seen one person swinging the cane from side to side. And um, in this, in where I am living now, um, some of the pavement is very wide and some is not very wide. Um, and in the shopping area, it's usually very wide, but there are lots of people. And I, I often wondered how, because there were at least two other people who didn't swing the cane from side to side, and, but they didn't seem to be able to see. And I, I had no idea, and I didn't like to ask how they were managing, but um, yeah. yeah. Well, and I just want to say that I've always thought after experience in both countries, England, I mean, uh, Germany and Austria and America, that in America, the blind are the privileged. And maybe that's true in other places. It's just um, they've, you know, there's been such a development of, of ways for people to function independently. And of course, in the technology industry, there's been a lot of amazing uh, things that have been developed, like like a reading machine that originally, the, you know, um, the, the man from MIT who developed this reading machine, it was like the old copy machines, this giant machine, stand up, you put your paper on the, uh, or book on the glass plate and the machine would read to you. And that's now, uh, you know, by the time Mark was of age, the wanting to have something like that, it was, it's become an iPhone. And that technology can be done. You just hold your phone up to thing and it will speak to you what's on the, what's on the printed page. So it's right. just, and there's amazing things. So um, anyway, but then we're getting off track because I want to know of a lot about more cultural differences than in England and America, if there are significant, very noticeable ones. Well, they're very noticeable to me after many, live, even though I grew up here, um, after many years of in the US, um, yeah, it, it, everything seems uh, very different. Um, I don't know how I would manage if I were trying to drive on the other side, but yeah, it, it's um, words. And the other thing that I had forgotten is that there are so many different accents um, in this in the United Kingdom? And Linda pointed out when we were in Scotland that she she knows the various accents in Scotland, Glasgow, etc. I know some of the accents in England, um, but mostly Devon or Manchester or Liverpool. And there are so many accents in between; it's astonishing. But um, so, so that, yeah, the cultural differences, the, it's the names of things which are so different. But the food, I mean, um, there's a lot of gluten-free and my favorite um, indulgence is fish and chips. And there's one place that has gluten-free fish and chips on Wednesday <laughs> because, <laughs> because the mother of the owner is a celiac and she, she runs the till 
And um, on Wednesday, um, the owner changes all the oil. And so the fish and the chips are gl gluten-free. The wheat is, there's no wheat. And then on Thursday, he puts, he changes the oil again and has regular fish and chips. It's just astonishing, but um, I'm, I try to, uh, I try to remember what to say, you know. <laughs> I try to remember to say pavement, not sidewalk. Uh, uh, but it's, um, if I have to think this hard, I can't imagine how people whose language is not English and who didn't grow up here. Yeah, and there's so many people whose language is not English and they speak such excellent English. Uh, it's just wonderful, just wonderful. So um, impressive. And it's hard to know why people want to live in this country, um, family, um, but it has a very good reputation, I suppose. Uh, the National Health Service, a good transportation system. The cost, the, the other thing is that the cost of living, it's, um, it's a strong link between relative wage costs and average cost of living. And in for the cheapest country in the world to live in, India has a monthly wage of $295 American dollars. And the UK has the fifth highest average wage, higher than the US of $3,065 per month. <clears throat> I converted that for you. <laughs> but yeah. It's a, it's a... Hey, so one thing I noticed when I was there for, it was about two weeks or so, was um, realizing that we get it from all sides. You know, I mean, what news I get from Australia or what news I get from Germany or what news people got there from about America um, and was we got it all the time in our performance because I was performing there and they didn't realize we were Americans for some reason at some point sometimes. And so when they heard the show, they were like, because there was a lot of shows critical of America. This is when Trump was in office. I was there. Yeah. And uh, when they would find out that we were Americans, they would go, you're Americans. Do other Americans think the way you do? And it made me realize, oh, OK, so everybody is just reading the papers and the papers looks like we're all cheering on this president or we're all for such and such. And I would say, well, no, there's a lot of people who are not for this or for that. And they were all kind of amazed. And then they were like grateful. It actually gave them hope because they thought, oh, we thought you were all you know, gone off the deep end or, you know, whatever it was, but it was kind of like, and then I thought, oh, then I started to look at the papers and then I could see that, okay, if you're reading the headlines, this is all you're getting. And it might look like all Americans are this and related mm -hmm. to that reverse, um, my partner's from Germany. So when her family or nieces come over to visit us, they'll be here in Wendell and they'll say, oh, wow, this is America. And we'll say, no, this is Wendell. Um, <laughs> And no, you're in, you know, New England, you're in Massachusetts. And then a couple of them went to Georgia and then they came back and they go, oh, so that's America's like, that's, we didn't know what Georgia was all about. We said, yeah, well, and then if you go to the Midwest and then you go to California, I mean, America's a lot of things. Right. And so I used to say that to folks when somebody would say, you know, oh, were you in Europe? And I was like, no, I was in Southern Germany. I wasn't in Europe. I was in this little town in Germany. And I don't know what the rest of Europe is like, you know, it's not. Uh, and so we throw those words around of where you've been. And, it, you know, I don't know if it's different of different parts of, you know, England, you know, when you would say, well, no, you're in Southern England, you're not in Northern England. It's a whole different you know, group of people. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's uh, you've touched very much on what uh, I was um, particularly I've been here just over two years now, which is amazing. And of course, a lot of it was COVID related. So, um, you know, we weren't going out and about, but um, most people would say to me, how is it that 45 is the president? And I'd say he has a lot of supporters and he knows how to push buttons. And universally, the people with whom I spoke thought he was just unacceptable. And when when I agreed with them, and they would then start, <clears throat> they would then start using more words, and I'd say, yes, I agree, <laughs> and it, they were very relieved. So I understand, Paul, because um, 
And the other thing that has surprised me greatly, I suppose it shouldn't because um, Brits are known to travel, but so many people had visited the US and mostly New York or California. <laughs> and um, it, was, uh, it was interesting to hear their, their comments. Of course, people have family and then one family, I would love to move, but the wife doesn't want to move because of family here, you know, but yeah, it's, um, and the other thing that, you know, people say to me, well, which do you like better? And I said, you really, you can't choose between blueberries and an orange. It's different. And the thing is, there's so many states and each state is so very different. And I remember having to adjust. I would live in, lived in New York for a while and then we moved to Connecticut. And then, yeah, so in, in the US, you have differences just over the line. And here, the differences are ubiquitous. <laughs> It's um, it's a, it's amazing, but yeah, there's a I do find a certain level of disapproval um, from Brits about America, and then when I if I pursue that a little more, it may be about the forty fifth president, it may be about racism, and I point out there's racism in this country, and then they agree, yes, that's true. Um, and interesting, if you talk about politics, um, people seem to be as fervent as they are in the US about, for instance, um, if I ask what people think about Boris Johnson, it's either a diatribe or delight. It's amazing. There's no, no middle ground. And I, I just wonder, if it's the social media, if it's the media, um, you know, programming us. Um, so I, I, all I know is it's an ongoing subject of great interest. <laughs> so, and I do get to vote. And even when I lived in the US and I, I could vote in the US, I would get letters from the British embassy saying, you know, you can vote in England. I'd say, um, I don't know what's going on in England. Um, I really don't. So, um, so I'm, I'm trying to learn. Um, I did vote in the local election. Um, and I think, I think Carol, you said to me, well, you don't have to vote when I was in a conundrum about it. And I said, no, I have to vote. I have to vote. So um, there we go. But this is so wonderful to see everybody. And yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. John Boss, has made, John Boss had so much that he wanted to share from many trips to England and he forgot about it. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yeah, I think we are, I think we are coming to our, to the close to the end of our time. I think, I'm not entirely sure. I think, I think it's, I think we're gonna go for just a couple more minutes. So I think, yes. and then I think Zoom may just stop. Sometimes it does, sometimes it warns me. It hasn't warned me yet. It might just turn off. And I think it probably will because, but. I, um, I just thought, uh, I, I know that everyone has, we've had a wonderful discussion. It's been great to hear um, from Hazel. I'm sure I'm speaking for all of you that it's been delightful um, to hear all of the, the differences, the similarities, the, um, I'm just struck by the number of people on the call and all of our different experiences. And it's amazing to me that through some sort of weird technology and the same language, sort of, um, we are we are connecting as neighbors across a giant world, which I think is pretty amazing, and I'm I'm delighted. Uh, I don't know if you have any final words for for us, Hazel, before you say goodbye. Um, I don't know. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Jeremiah. I really appreciate your facilitating. Edie, did you have anything you wanted to say about anything? <laughs> oh, I was in England about. Uh in the mid 80s and mm -hmm. got to visit Manchester and mm -hmm. they were so excited up there. They were just renovating their big municipal building which had to have been a square uh, block. If I remember it was rounded and very palatial and they were just beginning renovations. And then we took a train south to London and were pure tourists for a week, just running around. Actually, my ex-husband was looking for a mug and it was a particularly wonderful adventure because it was an object to which we went all different places that we might not otherwise go. <laughs> and uh, I, we went to Hyde Park and I sat in Hyde Park and my daughter created a book for me for my birthday this year. 
and she dragged up a picture of, that was taken when I was in Hyde Park in England. I thought, oh my God, I completely forgot about that. And it was a really fun adventure. We did the usual tourist things and then some less usual ones and I loved it. But I did, and then we spent about uh, two or three months in Northern, just South of Northern Ireland on the Isle of Achill. And that's where I experienced driving a car on the other side of the road. But it was such a remote place that you were the only one on the road for most of the island when you were driving anyway. So it, it had very little impact. We had fun being confused, but not threatened. Oh, so those are my England experiences, my, my, great, my great Britain experiences uh, that you. are quite memorable. They were fun. And I still hope to get to Scotland someday. We'll see. And certainly to visit you with me sometime. We'll look forward to it this coming year if we can. Yay, wonderful. And Hazel, Hazel yes. I would tell you something quick if there's a minute about our time in England. Shall yes. I tell you real quick? Okay, um, 1969, um, when I was 19, my brother was 17, my, the four, my mom and dad, my brother and I went to um, Europe and we landed in Heathrow. And then while we were in Europe, given the, the Vietnam War and how hated Americans were, we just kind of passed as Canadians. <laughs> And, and mm -hmm. uh, my father wore like a kind of a business suit throughout the whole trip just to kind of look, you know, not like an American. And then when one day I was off on my own in Piccadilly Circus, just exploring. And I had always sort of thought of the people in England as being, you know, all Anglo and everything. And then I just bumped into this really nice, you know, young woman about my age. And we just hooked up and hung out. And I was surprised she was from Pakistan. But, you know, she was just very English. And it was just great. That's all. It was just wonderful fun. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm, I was so delighted to see everybody and to hear because I, I, I knew that there'd be a, a wide variety of differences. And Phyllis and Mark, what fun to see you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad because I remember you telling me about being very, very wet in England and standing, sitting in a tea room and wondering if you were to stop. And you know, in this area, in my area, Southwest, people have to plant drought resistant gardens because we get so little rain. Um, yeah, I know it's astonishing, um, but I think it's changing. We had a day of rain in the two years that I've been here. So I think things are changing, <laughs> which is climate change. But, but I, I do th I think, I think we probably think my computer is going to end. So I should probably all <laughs> um, thank say you. goodbye. Thank you, Hazel. Th thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, um, everyone. So thank you, Hazel. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, at least I'll be in touch. Bye. 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 Can we?